Section thirteen of Romances of Old Japan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Romances of Old Japan by Ye Theodora Ozaki. Loyal even unto death. Part three. Matsuo deliberately examined the head of his own son, carefully and searchingly from every side. He scrutinized the little face now so still and pallid sometimes his eyes blinked to hide the gathering tears and once his face contracted with pain but at last he loudly pronounced the momentous verdict oh there can be no doubt that this is the head of kanshu sai the son of the lord sugawara triumph at the success of his loyal plot conquered every other feeling and he slammed the lid back into place gemba delighted that there had been no mistake and that the gruesome commission had been successfully carried out accorded words of praise to takebe for beheading the boy as a reward for this deed you will be pardoned for harbouring him so long let us hasten to take the head to lord tokihira he said turning to matsuo yes it is better that no time should be lost responded the latter but as my duty is now finished may i request to be discharged on sick leave certainly gemba replied as your mission is satisfactorily concluded you may go he then took up the tray with the bleeding head strode to the door and calling his attendants pompously set out at once for tokihira's palace outside the gate he stopped and mockingly addressed takebe <laughs> he laughed though you take great care of the boy usually when your own life is in danger you do not fail to cut off his head <laughs> and the cruel man with this parting sneer went on his ruthless way matsuo silently followed him out of the house and got into his kago the husband and wife now that they were left alone were quite exhausted from the emotion and stress of the past hour they went out and closed the gates both were speechless with joy for some minutes the master sighing with relief bowed his head and turned to the four points of the compass silently returning thanks to the deities whose help he had invoked oh heaven be praised he exclaimed at last the gods have accorded their mighty aid to our cause and mercifully caused matsuo's eyes to be dimmed so that he mistook the other boy's head for that of our young prince heaven has clearly interposed to help our lord let us rejoice my wife yes yes she answered what a terrible strain it has been in some unfathomable way the spirit of our lord must have cast a veil over matsuo's eyes or that head may have become a golden buddha to help our cause though there was a slight resemblance between the two boys yet they differ in reality as much as brick from gold i was so transported at the success of our plan that i almost wept aloud with the poignancy of joy when i saw that matsuo was deceived when the loyal couple had given vent to their feelings simultaneously they rushed to the side room where they had concealed their precious charge the one from the side and the other from the front pushed aside the screens genzo then raised one of the tatami a padded mat three feet by six feet disclosing a cavity in the floor out of which rose up the aristocratic form of kanshu sai safe and untouched by his enemies they gazed at him in silence overwhelmed suddenly a knocking at the gate and the voice of kotaro's mother disturbed them i am the mother of the new pupil let me in startled they hastily closed the screens at this turn of events tonami was at her wit's end and knew not what to do for the best she ran to and fro across the room like one demented seeing that tonami was losing her self-control and was about to burst out into excited speech her husband enveloped his hand in the sleeve of his robe and covered her mouth he held her still with grim determination remember what i said a short time ago it means simply this 
nothing is so precious as our young lord you weak creature he added with disdain as he saw his wife's trepidation then he turned and went to the entrance i fear my naughty boy must be giving you a great deal of trouble said the newcomer as takebe let her in but what has become of him now to gain time takebe replied little knowing that he was confronted by a soul as strong in loyalty to the sugawara as his own he is in the house playing with the other children school is over for to-day so you must take him back with you very well she assented and started towards the house directly her back was turned takebe drew his sword and tried to cut her down from behind ochio a samurai woman was a trained fencer she swiftly comprehended the meaning of takebe's movement even before he drew his sword the sound as it left its sheath confirming what her alert senses divined quick as lightning she darted aside barely escaping the deadly weapon as it tried to compass her destruction again and again the desperate man thrust at her all would be lost even now if this woman discovered that her boy had been slain to save their lord's son with a box which she carried in her hand ochio skilfully parried the blows wait wait what is the matter she gasped out but her frenzied antagonist was far too excited to listen and he struck out with such good will that the box which served her as a shield was speedily cut in two and there appeared unfolding and fluttering in the breeze as they fell a little winding sheet and a sacred banner used for the dead bearing in black hieroglyphics the inscription namu amida butsu all hail great buddha takebe's hand was paralyzed by this unexpected apparition bewildered as to what this could mean he glanced inquiringly at ochio was my boy considered worthy to take the place of our young lord or not she asked meeting his gaze steadily with her clear eyes tell me the truth at such totally unlooked-for words takebe was confounded more than ever was it possible that the enemy he was seeking to destroy had unexpectedly become a friend oh oh he stammered did you understand and anticipate all this yes of course answered the brave mother as i anticipated everything i prepared and brought these things in kotaro's box whose wife are you cried the astonished man as he sheathed his sword before she could answer a voice from outside the gate chanted a poem ume wa tobi sakura wa karuru yo no naka ni nani totte matsu wa tsure nakakura footnote matsu the first hieroglyphic of matsuo's name ume plum blossom and sakura cherry were the names of matsuo's brothers in my service plum blossom has fled the cherry has withered how then can the pine be heartless to me rejoice my wife our boy has done his duty when these brief words conveyed to the heroic woman that the sacrifice had been consummated in the tragic fate of her cherished son her brave spirit failed her and she fell unconscious to the ground what a poor creature you are exclaimed her husband as he entered the room at the unexpected arrival of matsuo the schoolmaster and his wife were more confused than ever but with an effort takebe attempted to regain his self-possession i will use more ceremonious speech afterwards you matsuo whom we all believed a traitor to behave like this what is the meaning of it all it is quite natural that you cannot understand we were three brothers all were faithful vassals of michizane the minister of the right to whom my family was deeply indebted i matsuo latterly entered the service of tokihira and on this account i was disowned by my father i dissimulated thus the better to serve lord sugawara however the position proved intolerable and to get my dismissal i feigned illness 
it was at this juncture that the news of where kanshu sai was concealed reached the ears of tokihira a messenger informed me that i would be released from office if i would undertake the mission of securing the head of our young lord i felt sure that you would never commit such a crime but if no substitute could be procured i knew that you would be desperate thinking that the time had come to repay the debt of gratitude to our generous benefactor i consulted with my wife and we sent our own boy to take the place of his son that is why i counted the number of desks to see if he were already here or not lord sugawara composed the poem i quoted just now showing his discernment of my character in that poem he asks how can the pine be heartless towards me but the world in general interpreted those lines in a contrary sense and every one denounced me as a cowardly deserter you may imagine genzo how i resented this if i had had no son i must have passed as a traitor all my life there is no possession so precious as a son o chiyo who had meanwhile recovered from her faint was intently listening to her husband's explanations with a composed demeanour but at these words she could restrain her emotion no longer and sobbed aloud oh how our kotaro must rejoice although in another world to hear such sentiments from his father those words are his best requiem when i left him a short time ago he looked unusually sad for his childish mind understood that he was about to die i intended to go home and deceive him saying that i was going to the next village and would return soon but i could not go home oh the yearning to see even his dead face once more was so great that i came back you may scoff at my weakness but my sorrow is well nigh unendurable had our kotaro been born ugly and brought up as a common child he might not have suffered such a death but as he was beautiful obedient and good he was chosen for the sacrifice could i have known his untimely fate i would never have found fault with him oh my son my little little son and the poor woman overcome with the poignancy of her grief and the bitterness of her renunciation fell with her face to the mats trying to suppress the rending sobs which seemed to tear her breast asunder here tonami came close to the sorrowing mother and murmured in tones of sympathy only a short hour ago when my husband had decided that he should be the substitute for the young prince kotaro came up to him and said innocently master please take care of me when i think of this though i am but a stranger i feel as if my heart would break i can imagine how desolate his true mother must be to lose such a sweet child and the tears fell from her eyes no no tonami no no my wife you must not weep it was our own decision to let him die in the place of our young lord you o chiyo ought to be ashamed to give way like this before strangers but and matsuo turned anxiously to takebe although i carefully explained to my boy the reason for his fate and how he should die with dignity tell me did he meet death in a miserable way or did he die like a samurai yes oh yes takebe quickly replied when i told the brave boy that his head must be cut off to save our young lord the child of his benefactor he calmly and courageously without a word placed his neck in readiness for the sword he did not attempt either to hide or to escape from his impending doom you must have taught him well he even smiled at the last rest assured of that the schoolmaster could say no more with strong restraint he tried to hide his feelings and pretended to laugh but the forced mirth ended with a choking sound in his throat at this point the stoic father broke down and wept and as he wiped away the slow tears he said in a low voice he was both good and clever was our little kotaro even at the age of nine he takes the place of his parents 
to prove our gratitude to our lord he is a filial child a fortunate child to be able to do that the more i think of it the more it recalls my brother sakura maru he died without being able to make any return for the obligation he was under to his lord how he must envy our boy oh kotaro soon followed him to another world wailed o chiyo and with these words she burst into another paroxysm of grief the young sugawara the innocent cause of this tragedy overhearing the poor mother's heart-rending sobs came out from an inner room pale and awe-stricken if i had only known that he was going to die for me i would not have allowed it oh how sad how sad he exclaimed and with his long sleeve he wiped away the tears from his eyes matsuo and his wife turned and bowed to the little fellow while he spoke for this boy's sake their family must sink into oblivion and nothingness and be no longer remembered among the living for his sake there would be no one to keep up the rights of the dead before their ancestors tombs or their own when they should be no more on this altar of loyalty to his father's house they had offered all that this world held for them of joy hope and ambition on this altar they had laid up for themselves a cheerless desolate childless old age to this sublime ideal of duty unhesitatingly unflinchingly regardless of themselves and the acuteness of their sufferings these simple martyr souls had made this great renunciation that the young lord should realize this sacrifice they had not in the least expected his words surprised them it was balm to their stricken hearts that even in some small measure he could appreciate what they had done for him then matsuo rose and went to the porch i have brought a present for our young master and with a whistle he summoned a kago that had been waiting in the garden as soon as the bearer set it down out stepped the lady sugawara oh my mother my mother almost shouted the boy as she quickly entered the house her long mantle of gold brocade and crimson linings flashing colour as she moved oh my son my beloved son cried the overjoyed mother folding the child to her heart the schoolmaster and his wife exclaimed with joy when they realized the identity of the newcomer after their respectful greetings takebe said i have been long striving to discover your hiding-place where can your ladyship have taken refuge all this time matsuo answered for her when her ladyship was hiding in the suburbs tokihira's retainers got scent of her retreat and nearly succeeded in taking her prisoner knowing her danger i disguised myself as a yamabushi footnote yamabushi a wandering priest and managed to rescue her just in time so she has been concealed in my house ever since without delay you must now escort her and kanshusai to kawachi footnote kawachi where the friends of sugawara were the strongest so that they may once more be a united family safe from the pursuit of their enemies then turning to his wife he added now let us carry home the body of kotaro and begin the preparation for his funeral rites but before ochiyo could answer tonami reverently carried the headless body of the slain child to the kago ochiyo followed and kneeling placed over kotaro the white shroud and the sacred banner matsuo and his wife then took off their outer robes revealing the white garments of ceremonial mourning in readiness for the obsequies takebe and his wife made a gesture of surprise and deprecation it is against custom that parents should attend the funeral of their own son let us spare you this trial we will do everything in your place they cried no no said matsuo loyal unto death even the death of his only son for the sake of his lord this is not the body of my boy we are going to bury our young lord with these words matsuo and his wife took their farewells 
then turning in silence they followed the impromptu bier which bore all that was left to them of their well-beloved child and with bowed heads reverently wended their way towards their now desolate and empty home lady sugawara her son genzo and tonami with tears falling from their eyes watched the little procession slowly disappear down the road into the deepening shadows of the night note the memory of the unfortunate statesman sugawara no michizane is surrounded by a halo of romance which affords an insight into japanese character he belonged to an ancient family of professional literateurs and had none of the titles which in that age were commonly considered essential to official preferment by extraordinary scholarship singular sweetness of disposition and unswerving fidelity to justice and truth he won a high reputation and had he been content with the fame his writings brought him and with promoting the cause of scholarship through the medium of a school which he endowed he might have ended his days in peace but in an evil hour he accepted office and thus found himself required to discharge the duties of statesmanship at a time of extreme difficulty when an immense interval separated the rich and the poor when the arbitrariness and extortions of the local governors had become a burning question when the nobles and the princes were crushing the people with merciless taxes and when the finances of the court were in extreme disorder michizane a gentle conservative was not fitted to cope with these difficulties and his situation at court was complicated by the favour of an ex-emperor uda who had abdicated but still sought to take part in the administration and by the jealousy of the fujiwara representative tokihira a young impetuous arrogant but highly gifted nobleman these two men michizane and tokihira became the central figures in a very unequal struggle the forces on the one side being the whole fujiwara clan headed by the unscrupulously daring and ambitious tokihira those on the other a few scholars the love and respect of the lower orders and the benevolent tolerance of the self-effacing michizane the end was inevitable michizane falsely accused of conspiring to obtain the throne for his grandson an imperial prince had married his daughter was banished to dazaifu and his family and friends were either killed or reduced to serfdom the story is not remarkable it contains no great crises or dazzling incidents yet if michizane had been the most brilliant statesman and the most successful general ever possessed by japan his name could not have been handed down through all generations of his countrymen with greater veneration and affection brinkley japan its history arts and literature page 256 End of section 13. Recording by Maricel Quee.